I was <coughs> speaking the last day of a number of ups and downs uh, in a <coughs> chart that looked like a Loch Ness monster of, of uh, Israel rising to a certain ideal level and then dropping to a level of bondage or invasion or exile. And uh, I suggested that the categories on top and the categories on the bottom are all metaphorically identical with one another and that one has to understand the extent to which the Bible relies on metaphorical identification. Uh, metaphor in the Bible is not an ornament of language, it is the controlling mode of thought. And <clears throat> metaphor is a statement which grammatically reads, this is that. And uh, as all statements that two things are the same thing while being two things are illogical or rather anti-logical, <clears throat> we have to take that into consideration too as one of the important things about the Bible. It is not using the language of logic or predication. It is using a language which it has in common with poetry, but <clears throat> using it for a slightly different purpose. Now, I said that there was, first of all, a story at the beginning of the Bible, according to which Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden and was then thrown out of it into the wilderness. And we can call this, if you like, the paradisal form of existence. And on the ideal side, we have the, I am using the word apocalyptic. Uh, it means, uh, apocalypse means, re uh, means revelation. The last book in the Bible is Apocalypsis Ioannu, the Apocalypse of or Revelation of John. And <clears throat> what the Bible has to reveal is, among other things, an ideal mode of living. And that exists in various categories. And the first category that's presented to us is the the, the uh, paradisal one, which is given us in the form of a garden or oasis. And that is represented as the world that God made to put man into, rather than a world which achieved its form through human effort. And of course, for desert dwellers, the oasis with its trees and its water would be the perfect image of providential creation, of something provided for man without man's needing to do anything about it. Now, all these images in the Bible have both a group form and an individual form. And the individual form of this garden or oasis imagery is the imagery of trees and water. And make it singular if you like. We are told that there were two trees in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, good and evil. And <clears throat> There are certain complications there that we'll come to later. They, they would be metaphorically the same tree in two different, different areas or, or categories of existence. So we can say that 
there is the tree of life and the water of life. The water of life is not explicitly called that in the Genesis account, but it's quite clear that that is what it is uh, from the use of the image elsewhere in the Bible. Now, there are several interesting things about this. The account in Genesis says that it doesn't speak, as I say, explicitly of the water of life, but it does speak of rivers. There are two accounts of creation in the book of Genesis. The one with which the Bible begins is a much later account. It's known as the priestly account. And uh, it's a kind of semi-philosophical cosmog uh, cosmogony. And a much earlier account begins in chapter 2 and verse 4, beginning with the paragraph, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. And that is the earlier account, and the way you tell it from its predecessor is that the word for God suddenly changes. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read, in the beginning, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That's the word for God in the first chapter. That word is plural. The I am ending is a regular Hebrew plural. And so it would be theoretically possible, though very bad scholarship, to translate the opening verse of Genesis as in the beginning the gods created heaven and earth, a fact which greatly amused Voltaire when he learned it, but uh, the fact had been known for many centuries before him, and St. Augustine had explained the plural form as referring to the Christian trinity, <clears throat> which isn't very much better as scholarship, <laughs> but uh, actually the I am is what is known as an intensive plural. Uh, a plural of, of majesty or impressive, impressiveness. Uh, when somebody told an off-color joke in the presence of Queen Victoria, Queen Victoria said, we are not amused, meaning the British Empire is represented by Queen Victoria. <laughs> that was the use of an intensive plural. And so you get the plural form of God uh, used in the first chapter of Genesis. Then in the second chapter, beginning of the fourth verse, he, the name for God shifts to Yahweh, or at least that is probably the close to the way it was pronounced, though nobody knows how it was pronounced. It's four Hebrew letters, sorry. And as you perhaps realize, in Hebrew of the Old Testament, only the consonants are written down, and all the vowels, or practically all the vowels, are editorial. <clears throat> uh, the result was that in reading the book, in if, uh, reading from the scriptures in public worship, this word, Yahweh, or Yahweh, was regarded as too sacred to be pronounced, and so a different set of vowels was substituted from the word Adonai, which means Lord, and that gave you a hybrid form that would be something like Jehovah, and by way of Luther's German Bible, that got into English as Jehovah, which is the normal anglicization of this uh, word, Yahweh. Well, <clears throat> it is only in this second account that you get much emphasis on the story of the garden, the oasis. And as I say, the water of life is not explicitly called that, but we are told that there was a river 
which watered the whole garden. It's spoken of as a single river. And this is in chapter 2, verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Then they, <clears throat> the four rivers are listed. Two of them are the Euphrates and Tigris of Mesopotamia. The word Mesopotamia means the land between the two rivers. And the third, the Gihon, apparently is the Nile. And the fourth one is more mysterious, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived in New Testament times. The fourth river was the Ganges. He probably meant the Indus. But in any case, you have then a garden stretching from Egypt to India, which would provide a fair amount of space for two people to wander in. And, uh, it, it, it is watered by four rivers which are explicitly said to have one source. And <clears throat> in fact the creation in this second account, this Yahweh's account, begins with the watering of the garden in Verse 6, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. The word mist, though it's a fairly accurate rendering of the Hebrew word, doesn't make much sense in this context. The Septuagint, the Greek translation, has pege, fountain. And fountain is, is something that recurs throughout the imagery of the Bible. What is interesting is the assumption that there are two seas under the earth, a sea of sweet or fresh water and a sea of salt water. After all, it, it's uh, a matter of common observation that fresh water is under the ground because it comes up in springs and in wells. And so you have scattered through the early books of the Bible, various references to a sea of fresh water under the ground, and it is this sea of fresh water that waters the Garden of Eden. In the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment forbids, forbids the Israelites to make an image of any god, including the god of the waters under the earth. And it, that suggests, if it, by implication, that there must have been other people living near the Israelites who did have such gods and did have uh, statues and temples uh, erected in their honor. The Sumerians, who are the beginning of Near Eastern civilization, had such a god, his name was Enki, and uh, he was, like many fertility gods, an unwearied seducer of female divinities, but uh, he also seems to have been something of a protector of the human race and speaks up for it when the equivalent of the flood story turns, turns up and the gods propose to destroy humanity. In, uh, In the kingdom which replaced Sumer, the kingdom of Akkad, that was, that was a Semitic kingdom and they spoke a Semitic language. And uh, they took most of their mythology over from Sumer, but they also had a god of the sweet waters, which they called Abzu. Some people have tried to connect it with the Greek word abyss. And, uh, <clears throat> His consort, Tiamat, uh, who was the goddess of the bitter waters, the salt waters. And uh, according to the creation poem, which the Akkadians had, Abzu was killed and his 
consort, now a widow, Tiamat, the goddess of the bitter waters, decided to revenge herself on the gods. The gods were terrified of her, all except the hero god Marduk. Marduk killed Tiamat, split her in two, and made the heavens out of half of her body and the earth out of the other half. Um, <clears throat> And that story of the creation beginning with the dragon killing is something that the Hebrew authors of the Old Testament were quite familiar with, though they used it as poetic imagery, not as a matter of belief. And even the late account of creation in Genesis 1, with which the Bible begins, has some faint echoes of an earlier account where the creation was the result of a victory over a dragon. Uh, Genesis begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, tohu wabohu, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the word deep is to home. And the scholars tell us that those Hebrew words are connected etymologically with the proper name, Tiamat, the goddess of the bitter waters, so that the biblical account of creation makes it out of, out of uh, a chaos, which is a more philosophical version of the uh, salt sea. Nevertheless, the sea remains an image of chaos all through the Bible, as we shall see. In addition to the freshwater sea under the ground, there is also assumed to be a source of, of fresh water up in the sky, much higher up than the rain clouds. In the first chapter of Genesis, we are told that after the creation of light, there was a creation of a firmament, that is a sky, which divided the waters below from the waters above. And those waters above the heavens are referred to in one of the Psalms later, Psalm 148, if you want to look it up. And only once in history did these two bodies of water above and below prove destructive. And that was when, the, at the time of Noah's flood, they poured in to reinforce the, uh, the rains and the uh, bursting out of the, of the sea and uh, helped to drown the world. So that you are first of all presented with a conception of a water of life which is both above and below. And that leads to the suggestion that the water of life that is being talked about here is not quite the same thing as ordinary drinking water. In other words, the suggestion is that man could live in water as, as well as a, a, a fish and, and that the uh, and that there would be a state of existence in which water does not drown, uh, does not necessarily drown man, but he can live in it as, as one of his own elements. And all through the early books of the Bible, particularly in the account of the uh, Exodus, and the wanderings in the wilderness, naturally the water supply was a matter of life and death, and there are a great many references to, uh, to trees and water. And one of the most important uh, contrasts in biblical imagery is the contrast between living water and dead water. And uh, the King James Bible 
its great weakness as a translation is, is its fondness for rationalized translations, or what the funeral service calls the comfort of a reasonable religion, and consequently it's much less metaphorical than the actual Bible is, and it will say things like springing water, where the Hebrew original has living water. And <clears throat> the, the first event in the Bible, then, is the expulsion from Eden, Eden and the loss of the tree of life and the water of life. We are explicitly told that as regards the tree of life. At the end of chapter 3 in verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. That's a rather strange verse, at verse uh, 22. It has God addressing an assembly of other gods and speaking as somebody actually terrified of the power that man has now acquired through his knowledge of good and evil. In fact, he's so terrified he can't even finish his sentence. And uh, the uh, sense of losing the tree and tree of life at, at any rate, and by implication the water of life, is certainly very strongly marked in its emphasis. That is the first event. If you look at the last event in the Bible, that is in Revelation 22, the, the very last chapter of the last book in the New Testament. And that begins, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So that the opening incident in the Bible is man's loss of the tree and water of life. The closing incident of the Bible is his regaining of the tree and water of life. <clears throat> and you notice that the river of life is described as a street. That is, it has become an element in which man can live. <clears throat> Any question that far then? Sorry? Yeah. Yes. Was the first one Elohim Well, um there are two very old sources in the first five books of the Bible, and one of them uses the term Elohim for God, and the other one uses Yahweh, and consequently the scholars call them the J narrative and the E narrative. The priestly one also uses Elohim, but it's very much later, and it's usually referred to as P, and then Deuteronomy, which is the... Uh, uh, comes from a, uh, a different development. Is, is that the thing you meant? Uh, yes. The, uh, but the E narrative is, is much older than the priestly one. Um, what language was the New Testament written? The New Testament? The New Testament was written in Greek. 
but it was written by people whose native language was probably not Greek and were probably thinking in the language which by that time had replaced Hebrew as a spoken language in Judah, the language we call Aramaic. And uh, Aramaic was probably the language that Jesus and his disciples would have spoken. And uh, when uh, uh, Jesus says, Thou art Peter, and upon this Petra, this rock, will I build my church, that's a pun in Greek and it suggests the speaking of Greek. But, curiously enough, the same pun works in Aramaic. And uh, <clears throat> it's probable that, that uh, when John the Baptist says, God is able from these stones, Banham, to raise up children, Benham, to Abraham, that again, the, the original has a pun which is concealed in the Greek version. Yeah. Well, I don't know how I can make it clearer except to. Uh, well, I, I don't understand what you're getting at. Uh, is there some proof of what you're saying? Or? <laughs> well, I, I think that the proof Well, as I say in the in the book of Revelation, it it becomes a, it becomes a street, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> it points to a level of symbolism in which. Uh, in which Noah's flood has never really receded. The world that we are living in now, the fallen world into which Adam was thrown, being submarine. And that is one reason why there's a great deal of fish symbolism and, and other images having to do with water. But uh, we'll see later that the same thing is true of fire, that uh, the suggestions are that man in the state of apocalypse or resurrection could live in all four elements and not merely in earth and air as he now does. And uh, that there is a, a fire of life and a water of life. It's in the account of the flood itself. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, chapter 7 of Genesis and verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, of the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. But the, the windows of the heaven suggest a source of water above the rain clouds. If you look at that uh, psalm that I, uh, uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier, it's the Psalm 108, uh, 148, rather. The, uh, In the fourth verse, praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Well, it's a matter of common observation that their rain clouds are below the heavens. And uh, the uh, implication of there being water above, uh, behind the windows of heaven, is, uh, indicates another dimension of water. Uh, am I think of what? Uh, yes, about. Yes, but you said that that was the strongest, one of the strongest images in the Bible itself, one of the running threads in the Bible in terms of purification. Well, it's, it certainly is one, is one of the recurring images in the Bible, yes. A, uh, it, it's one of a, of a very large group of images, but it's one that does, uh, does recur. 
and echo all the way through from the beginning to the end. And almost the last thing the Bible says is in Revelation is the invitation to drink of the water of life. <clears throat> Sorry, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Yes. Does it reoccur at all in the Bible? Um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a rather sinister tree in the sense that it brings about disaster to the human race. And as we go on elaborating these images, we'll see that, that all of these ideal images have their counterparts, their opposites which we'll call the demonic images in a more sinister world. And that just as you have a tree of life, so you'll have a tree of death because the, the result of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was mort mortality. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I, I think that uh, that the, uh, the the development of the intensive plural is something that you could get without necessarily an antecedent polytheism. Uh, the name of the supreme god is El, in which is a singular form, in pre-biblical mythology. So it goes back a very, very long way. And uh, the, uh, the use of, of the plural form hasn't so much the sense gods as the sense godhead, that is, of, the, of a kind of ambience. Adonai? Well, it means Lord, and uh, it's uh, the the vowels were were taken from that word and applied to the consonants of the word Yahweh, making the name Yehovah. But uh, the, the name the name Lord is uh, at least the, the word Lord is the uh, common Semitic term. It's really just, a, as you see, very closely related to the word Adonis, which uh, also is the name, although it's the name of a heathen god, also means Lord. And similarly with the word Baal, which again means something like Lord. <clears throat> Well, um, the cross, of course, is a prototype of the tree of life in that it's an image of human salvation. It's a prototype, or an antitype, rather, we'll come to that later, too, of uh, the tree of death in its context as, uh, as what man does to God whenever he can catch him. And, uh, so that it, the cross is really ambiguous in that way, but the contrast of tree of life and tree of death runs through the New Testament too. And uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus draws distinctions between the, the good tree that bears good fruit and the corrupt tree that bears evil fruit. And you have such episodes as the cursing of the barren fig tree and uh, other images of a, of a death tree. <clears throat> Oh, he, uh, I, d I didn't give you that part. It, it uh, took place before the poem begins, and we don't know how it, what, what happened. Well, uh, Tiamat is, um, she is not explicitly said to be a dragon 
in the poem, but she breeds dragons, and they must have got their heredity from somewhere. Now, <laughs> uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the beginning and the end of the Bible, therefore, are punctuated by the themes of the of the uh, loss and the regaining of the tree and the water of life. Now, at this point, I want to introduce a principle which is going to be very central in this course, and that is the New Testament's attitude to the Old Testament. The New Testament's view of the Old Testament is that it presents what is essentially a prophecy of what is going to happen later, namely the coming of Christ. And consequently, everything that happens in the Old Testament is a type of something that happens in the New. What happens in the New Testament explains the Old Testament happening, and therefore it's called an anti-type. Now, if you look, for example, at the Epistle to the Romans in the New Testament of Paul, Romans 5 and verse 14. Uh, Paul says, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Uh, well, the Greek word that Paul uses that's translated figure here is the word typos, T-Y-P-O-S, typos. And the Latin rendering in the Vulgate is forma, but the King James Bible has figure because for the most part it was the word figura that had come to be the, the uh, Latin equivalent of the Greek word tupos, from which we get type. And so what Paul is saying is that Adam is a type of Christ, and elsewhere he speaks of Christ as the second Adam. And if you look at the first epistle of Peter, third chapter, 21st verse. Uh, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also save us. Um, here again is the word figure, but the Greek word is not typos, but antitypos, antitype. And what Peter is saying, or what the first epistle of Peter is, is saying, is that the Christian rite of baptism is the antitype of the saving of Noah's family from drowning. So that, that means that the New Testament is, among other things, a dense mosaic of allusions to the Old Testament. And of some books, that's particularly true, the book of Revelation and the epistle to the Hebrews, but there is hardly a passage in the New Testament, I suspect that there is not a single passage in the New Testament, that is not related in this type, anti-type way to something in the Old Testament. And consequently, that 
passage at the end of Revelation about the tree and water of life being restored to man must come from something in the Old Testament too. And you'll find it in the very middle of the Bible at the end of the book of Ezekiel. It's the second last chapter in Ezekiel and it's chapter 47. Ezekiel represents himself as being in Babylon during the captivity and his prophecy is directed towards the Jews returning from the Babylonian captivity to their homeland to start by rebuilding the temple. And the last eight chapters of the book of Ezekiel are a detailed vision of the proper worship of God being reestablished in the forsaken and abandoned temple as it is during his prophecy. And in chapter 47, by that time, the temple has been pretty well rebuilt and the angel who was showing him this prophecy also shows him the rebuilt temple and says that as soon as the temple was complete, a spring of water bubbled up from the threshold of the temple and formed a river which flowed eastward. Now a river that rose in, on the hill of Jerusalem and flowed eastward would flow into the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea, of course, which is so salty that nothing can live in or around it, is a consistent image of dead water all the way through the Bible. And so we are told that this fresh water running into the Dead Sea will bring it to life. And uh, in verse 8, Then said he unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country, and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. I think that he has here a sense, not merely of the Dead Sea being turned into fresh water, but of all salt water being turned into fresh water. And that is again picked up by the author of Revelation, who says, at the beginning of the 21st chapter, just as the, the final vision begins, that heaven and earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And again, one has to think of that metaphorically. What the author of Revelation is saying is that in the final apocalypse there is no more dead sea, that is, there is no more dead water, that is, there is no more death. So that to say that there is no more sea is again a metaphor for saying that there was no more death. And in Ezekiel's vision in 47, you notice that along with the river, there comes a growth of trees along its bank. And in verse 7, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other, which suggests that metaphorically the tree of life in Eden is not so much a single tree as all the trees. And uh, he says that these trees are also trees of life in verse 12, by the river upon the bank thereof shall grow all trees for meat. Uh, you have to watch out for the 17th century translation meat in 1611 meant any kind of food. And uh, so you just, you just read food for meat. Grow, shall grow all trees for food whose leaf shall not fade. 
neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring new, forth new fruit according to his months. And that is all picked up and quoted by the author of Revelation, as we just saw. Um, some words are italicized because the, the particular word that is italicized is not in the Hebrew. It's been supplied in the translation. That's right. <laughs> yes, sometimes the King James Bible is quite a paraphrastic translation. I'd like to know what the Apocrypha is and what its value is in comparison to the body of the Old Testament. Well, the Apocrypha is a group of writings which, which uh, were rejected by Judaism because they couldn't find the Hebrew original of the text. They survive only in Greek translations, and in one case, Latin. And when Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, he put the Apocrypha in a separate appendix, but the Roman Church overruled him on that point and included the 14 Apocryphal books with their Bible. Protestant Bibles tend to preserve Jerome's practice of putting them in a separate section or leaving them out altogether. Okay.